he was a major help in getting the sound system ready. So without him, we wouldn't have these beautiful speakers as well functioning right now. So round of applause! Woo! Hi everyone. When I was asked to speak, um, the first time I couldn't even speak because I was so nervous. I was so moved and heartbroken by the things that I saw in the media that was going on. Um, first of all, my name is Denry George, and um, I'm a proud and privileged owner to have two Caribbean restaurants. Um, one is in Hamilton West, and the other is in Toronto East. Even one of my old staff is in the crowd right now, Newman and his family. Um, it's really hard to speak after what has been said already by Jamal's family. Um, I wanted to thank Black, Black Life team for this opportunity to speak. And I wanted to thank them for what they've been doing. Um, you know, being able to rally people around to try to make a difference. I wanted to just touch on a bit about my personal story. Um, I came to Canada in 1987 um, and I've experienced so many things. I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, when I came here, starting school in Scarborough, um, Toronto, Scarborough, um, you know, going to school was interesting because anything that you did almost as a black kid, you will get yourself in trouble. Um, the teaching was poor that we received. The, um, you know, you get suspended or you would get expelled for almost anything. Um, started working and right away, it's like the racism that I faced at work was incredible. Um, but growing up in Scarborough, you know, just watching all the townhouses and, you know, the high-rise building and seeing so many people living in such a small area. You know, I call it uh, like a breeding ground for criminal activity. You know, many times you would be there and you'd see the police driving around, basically just looking to see if they can arrest someone or chase after someone or something or the other. Um, and school for me, you know, became something that I kind of hated as a result of um, just the way that the system was set up and the teachers and how they dealt with the black students. Um, so my dad, after a couple of years of being in Canada, maybe three years, we moved to the suburb, you know, and I thought, okay, fine, we're gonna be free now because, you know, we're moving into like a house, right? Only to discover that moving into the suburbs was probably worse in some ways because now you were like singled out even more because you were just a few. Um, you know, things got tough again in school, things got tough at work, things got tough on the street. I remember one day I was working at a Wendy's restaurant and I was coming home in the evening with my bag and stuff and you know the police looked at me in the plaza and basically you know pulled me over and, um, and asked me what's in my bag. And I'm about 18 years old and I'm like, this is broad daylight, people are walking up and down. And here I am being searched by the police coming home from, uh, you know, going home from work. Um, many times when I started driving at a young age, I would be stopped by the police, you know, and um, they would be like, you know, this is a routine check. Um, sometimes they would make excuses like, oh, someone that fit your description, you know, just, um, Rob somewhere, this your, your car, you know, it, it's something's wrong with your car, all kinds of excuses just to pull me over to get my license, my registration, you know, to check me out basically. Um, you know, it got really frustrating, and, um, you know, I was on the verge of giving up, you know, trying to just move forward. And um, I got the opportunity to go back to my, my island, which is uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, after being here for four years and um, when I went home and I basically looked at where I was coming from you know I, I had a change of, of mind I had a change of spirit I had some kind of inner 
you know, um, I don't know, like spiritual awakening. And I said to myself that, um, you know, despite all the pressures that I face in Canada, I'm going to try my best to go back and to make some positive changes, you know, and, and fight to make sure that something good comes out of my life. And um, I came back and I went to school and I really tried hard. And I graduated with honors. Um, at one point, I never thought, <laughs> thank you. At one point, I never thought I'd even go to college or anything of that sort. And, um, you know, I started working in a hair salon. And by the grace of God, I went to George Brown College and, um, and I got, you know, my hairdressing license. And, um, you know, I left there with honors. I won an award. Again, almost everywhere I went, I was the only black guy, you know? Everywhere I went, I was alone, but I realized, you know what, it doesn't matter. I'm still gonna do what I gotta do, right? And um, even when I left George Brown, um, I probably was one of the only students that they had brought back from, you know, every few months to do a demonstration for the school. And um, still working in the salon, I met my wife at the time, and um, quickly after we opened our own salon, um, and I was about age 23 when we opened our salon, and by the time age 24, I was able to purchase a home in the suburb. And um, you know, from there, life just continued to to, to become interesting. Um, the love for young people, you know, continued to grow. Um, in my salon, I had professionals of all types. And the reason why I loved the fact that I went to George Brown College was I was able to learn how to do straight hair. So my clientele was every race and every culture and people from all around the world. And, um, you know, we shared so many stories and so many things. And, you know, this inner feeling came to me that, you know what, you need to do something. And I, I asked my, um, some of my clients that if they would have a speaking in the salon, and um, they had said yes, they would love to. And every Wednesday, for about a year and a half, as soon as the salon closed at six o'clock, I would have a speaker come in and speak to the young people. Because God had put clients that were accountants, bank managers, real estate agents, and on and on, right in my fingertip. And um, I realized, you know what, there's a great opportunity here. And I should take advantage of it because so much of the community was coming to the salon and I realized, you know what? I mean, the stories that I heard today, I mean, I have so many stories of friends dying, being shot and, you know, the whole nine. And we, we share the same, you know, experiences. And um, there's, a, there's a letter that was written by Willie Lynch. Um, I don't know if anyone knows about Willie Lynch's letter or Willie Lynch's theory, but it was a slave master in the Caribbean who um, basically, I call him the, 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 the slave master from hell. If you ever Google Willie Lynch's letter, you will see how he wrote this letter and it was so precise on how to basically break down um, black folks and cause them to, to work, you know, and, and not to be able to, um, to unite and, you know, and try to escape and all these different things. And um, so I started the meeting with that because I realized that, you know, from talking to young people and even myself, that you need to know where you are right now. You need to know sometimes your history, you know, your ancestral history. Um, so they were, there was a, there's a breakdown within where they are and where they want to be, you know. And I said, you know what? I'm going to use the salon, I'm going to use my clientele as an avenue and as a way for them to, to get to where they're going. And um, each week as the different speakers came and, and spoke, you know, it was so uplifting um, for them to hear from you know, uh, black people who have made it successfully in the community, you know, some an example to them to show them that you know what they can become a lawyer, they can become a doctor, they can become whatever they would like to be. And um, from those meetings, you know, people bought houses, they you know they got their credits fixed up, you know, um, all kinds of positive changes came about, and you know. When this situation started happening um, recently with all the shooting and stuff, which is ongoing, um, I spoke to the young lady that's um, the leader of this movement, and she said to me, you know, if I can come and, and speak to, you know, you guys, and um, I said to her, you know, I would love to meet, even if it's once a month or something, um, so that some 
real solid positive changes can be made. You know, so hopefully, you know, uh, people after these meetings will gather or, or will try to exchange information and try to find a way to um, continue to make things go forward. And um, lastly, I would like to say that, um, you know, even the restaurant, um, I've been trying to get, um, find a way to feed the homeless and see that COVID-19 has come about. Um, you, you can see homelessness, you know, growing so much in our community. Um, so I myself would love to have a few people come after the meeting and speak to me um, concerning how we can reach out to feed the homeless, you know, because that is something really, really um, dear to my heart. And lastly, you know, I pulled up at the restaurant about a week ago and there was a white gentleman about 40, 40 something years old and he was directly across from me and, and it looked like he was crying. And I walked over to him and I asked him, I said, you know, are you okay? And then he said to me, he's okay. I'm like, would you like something to eat? And he said, no. And then I walked inside the restaurant and I said to one of my staff, I said, make sure this man gets something to eat and something to drink. And she went out there and gave him something to eat, gave him something to drink. And, you know, to see him, you know, um, in that condition, it really touched my heart. I mean, I walked away from him and I was literally in tears. And I, I walked into the restaurant and my staff wanted to know what's wrong with me. And I said to her, I said, I'm crying. You know why I'm crying? Because it didn't matter about the race that he was or anything. It was about a human being literally crying, a, a man crying, just, you know, sitting in a parking lot. You know, that's such a terrible thing. And I'm like, you know, we need to do more um, to help those that are less fortunate. And I think I'll close with that. Thank you.